I became very aware of this voice, like this internal dialogue. My true self, the person I wanted to be my whole life. If prison didn't break me, if coming from a broken home didn't break me, if my own addiction didn't break me and I'm here, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah. So they came and offered me a plea deal. And I remember thinking about it and they offered me seven years. So instead of going to trial and potentially getting 30, 40, 50 years of life, I could take the plea deal and make guilt for something I didn't do. On today's episode, my guest spent 2,008 days in prison. He is a CEO and a founder of Unstoppable 365 MFR. He's a renowned speaker, coach, and author. Sean Michael Crane, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Man, Thanks it's an here. honor to have you here. Yeah, this is awesome, man. I love San Diego. You and I were already getting to talk a little bit. I feel like we have a lot in common, so it's going to be an amazing episode. I can feel it. Yeah, and the cool thing about these podcasts is I just happen to get the right people in the room where we have conversations like we we're having, and we just happen to record it so the rest of the world can hear it, right? Yep. And I know even just talking to you, I felt sharpened. I felt like I was becoming a better man just speaking to you a few moments ago. So let's impart some of that wisdom into others today. And I'm just going to hit the show off with a question. Sean Michael Crane, what do you value most in life? Man, that's a great question. I mean, the first answer that comes to me is my family. Mm. Like there's so much, right? I mean, I value my, my spirituality, my life experiences, going through hardships, but ultimately to be the man my family needs. Like my, my children and my wife, they're everything to me. Come on. I love that. And obviously you have a crazy story. People are leaning in right now. They're like, wait, did he say 2008 days in prison? Um, and we're going to get into that. But one thing you said when we were sitting out there before we came in here is you talked about raising the standard, raising the standard for men. What does raising the standard mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just think nowadays in society in 2023, the average man is living below their potential in all areas of life. So, I mean, the statistics show that you know, most men are obese. Most men are not making money to support their family. They're not happy. Like you see all these people battling addiction, depression, anxiety. It's just really bad right now. And I think it falls on men. I think that a lot of guys just don't hold themselves to a high enough standard. Like I'm not okay with looking in the mirror and not being as physically fit as mm. I should be. I'm not okay with losing my patience with my kids. I'm not okay with complaining about my life, but then not doing anything to change. Like just across the board, I think people are, are they're suppressing their potential. And so being incarcerated, showed me how quickly life can change and how valuable these moments are. And I looked back on 23 years of nothing but wasted opportunities, wasted potential. I was the guy that made excuses. I was the guy that said, I'll do it tomorrow. I was the guy that was just neglecting his life. But all the while I knew that there was something more for me. Yeah. And I think that everybody can relate to that. You know what I mean? So my mission now is to be an example to show people what's possible. If prison didn't break me, if coming from a broken home didn't break me, if my own addiction didn't break me, and I'm here and I'm living a life that I love, a life by design, then anybody. Raising the standard starts with each of us individually. We have to show up each and every day to be examples for the people at home, the people in our community, the people at work, and then it spreads. And there's a ripple effect that takes place. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I was just telling Sean, before I got here, I was serving at a camp of at-risk kids, orphans, kids that have been through the system, kids with incarcerated parents. And we were talking about our stories. And uh, last night, I was sitting, Sean, and listening to kids share testimonials, talking about some of the most horrific things in the world. And as I was sitting there, God gave me this revelation of that's who suffers when you don't live up to your standard. Exactly. 100%. I mean, I grew up with a, a dad who was addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I just knew that he had a lot of potential. Like He was a good man. Yeah. He had a lot of love. He cared about me, but he was just broken. Mm. And inside, he had a lot of demons. So he would drink, he would use drugs, and eventually he went to prison. And I suffered tremendously because of the way my parents lived. And I know that pain all too well. Like when you said those kids were sharing testimonials of stuff they'd gone through, yeah, like I felt that. You know what I mean? Because I was that kid. Mm. So my whole mission was to get myself right so that I could then change that in my family's lineage, right? I wanted to break that curse. I wanted to change that pattern. And I wanted to give my kids the dream life, man. Yeah. And I feel like I'm doing that. Like my wife and I, we, we're always going places, doing things with the kids, we have the patience. We give them the love. We're always together. Yeah. Like everything that a child deserves growing up to have an advantage in life. Here's the thing. How many kids grow up and they're at a disadvantage because of their environment? 
Yeah, dude. The majority. Too, too many. Yeah. They, they see their parents behaving a certain way. They don't look at their dad and they're not inspired. Instead, they're looking at people on TikTok and social media or on TV. Like every man, you should be your kid's superhero. Like yeah. they should want to be just like you. And the coolest thing is if you do it the right way and they, they want to emulate you, you're setting them up for massive success in life. And that's the best feeling in the world as a parent. Yeah, I mean, if a kid doesn't have good role models, they're going to look to the world to find that role model. Exactly. And what they're going to find in the world in its current state is not good role models. No, you're going to, it's the exact opposite of what we want for our children. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. I started hanging out with kids who had similar backgrounds as me, like their parents had gone to jail or their parents were divorced or they were going through hardships. And we, we identified with one another. We could relate. Yeah. But then we were all in pain and we were all suffering. So then we started doing drugs together to try to escape those feelings. Yeah. And then fast forward through my adolescence, I became addicted and dependent on drugs and alcohol. And for a time, I could never see my life without some substance, using the substance to numb out my pain, using alcohol, using pills, using marijuana to try to escape. Yeah. But it just kept me stuck. It never resolved the problem. Yeah, you keep you keep numbing, right? Like you have this wound and you have this pain. There was a time in my life I remember. I think Chief Keith came out with a song. I hate being sober. And I remember I'm driving around this car with my buddies. We're we're smoking weed. We're, we're you know we're popping pills. We're drinking. We're partying every night and we're screaming. I hate being sober. And I remember having the thought in my mind. I hate being sober. I don't ever want to be sober. I always want to feel this high that I'm feeling. But deep down, there was a wound. There was a pain. There was things I was numbing, I was hiding from. And the, the, the darkness and the sin that I was letting in my life, I wasn't ever fulfilled from that. I kept trying to get more and I kept trying to get more, but it never filled me. So it sounds like you were in a place like that. Well, I want to think what's really interesting is you have this powerful story that I think can shift people's lives. So you're living in that way, right? And then at 23 years old, something happens, which gets you incarcerated. Can we go there? Can you share yeah. that with us? Yeah, absolutely. So to backtrack real quick, I'm the guy from a broken home, lost both my parents at 14. Prior to that, I wanted to be a professional baseball player, and I had a lot of athletic ability, and I believed in myself. When I lost both my parents, my mom to the streets and her addiction, my dad to state prison, it absolutely broke me. So mm -hmm. from 13 or 14 till I was 23, I was that guy that could never be sober. I never envisioned being sober. I never wanted to be sober. And I was just high all the time, wasting my life away. And then at the age of 23, I was at a party and it was a college party and there was all these people drinking, talking, and all of a sudden there was two groups of men arguing. Uh, young men, drunk, just ready to fight. And me being drunk and high, I wanted to see the fight. So I was way too close to the altercation. I was like right there, yeah. ready to watch it. And as the fight broke out, I ended up getting tackled to the ground and I thought I was getting jumped by some of the guys that were fighting. So I'm wrestling around with this big guy on top of me. I'm trying to bear hug him and get him off of me. And finally, I roll him over. And as I did that, my only thought was, hit this guy. Like, yeah. He's going to swing on you as soon as you guys stand up, hit him. So I threw a couple punches, and I didn't even hit him. Like, they grazed the side of his head. So when he stayed face down on the ground, immediately I thought, wow, this is weird. Like, what's going on? And then so I stood up to my feet, and there was a, a street light. And it just was illuminating all this blood all wow. over me. Like I was covered in head, uh, all over my face, all over my arms, my whole chest, just dripping in blood. And in that moment, I, I knew something horrible happened. You know, so the next day I was charged with attempted murder because everyone at the party told the cops they saw me fighting with that guy. Yeah. And they assumed that I stabbed him. And that's what happened. Two guys were stabbed that night. That individual nearly lost his life. Like the report said that he, he lost his life three times that night on the way to the hospital, and they used the defibrillators to bring him back and revive him. And then my first day in court, my lawyer just walked up to me frantically. She didn't say anything else, but she said that the judge and the district attorney wanted to amend my charges to homicide because he was in a coma, and they didn't think he was going to make it. And that's like the first thing I'm hearing. This is all within a 48-hour period from yeah. the fight to court. And my, my picture was on the front page of the news press, Sean Crane charged with attempted murder. And I thought my life was over. I was 23, and I thought I was done. Wow. That's crazy. So, so you get incarcerated. You get found guilty. So I was incarcerated for six months fighting my case back and forth to court. And they, they came, and they offered me a plea deal. Now, in the time frame of those six months, I had a public defender, and they had an investigator who was out trying to find evidence to basically prove I was innocent. And nobody wanted to come forth and talk to the cops. No one wanted to get involved with the case. And there was a lot of people in the jail at that time or like, you know, the underworld that knew I was innocent. 
Like, people were talking about it. Like, oh, Sean's in there for something he didn't do. Everyone knew, but no one wanted to cooperate with the cops or come forward and get involved in the case. Yeah. And the evidence that the police wrote up in the report, it looked horrible. They had a bloody shirt. Everyone said that I was seen on top of the guy striking down at him. They used the word striking instead of punching. So even if you were to read the police report right now, you would assume I was guilty. It looked really bad. And I knew that no one in, ca in California, let alone my county, Santa Barbara, wins when you go to trial. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So they came and offered me a plea deal. And I remember thinking about it. They offered me seven years. So instead of going to trial and potentially getting 30, 40, 50 years of life, I could take the plea deal, admit guilt for something I didn't do, go do my time and get out. And my lawyer's like, man, you got to take this. You got to take this. You're not going to win in trial. And in my heart, I felt like that's what I should do. Because during those six months, I went through a massive transformation. Internally, psychologically, like everything in my life was different in that short period of time. Yeah, Being locked in a cell for 24 hours a day with no distractions, no phone, no TV, no kids to raise, no job to go to, it was life-changing. And in that time, I got very clear on like this internal dialogue. I, I became very aware of this voice, like this internal dialogue. My true self, the person I wanted to be my whole life. And I was sober, so I was free of drugs and alcohol for the first time. I was isolated every day. I had just time to myself. And the severity of my situation, like life in prison, it was just yeah. so intense. It created this, this massive transformation internally inside of me. So for the whole six months, I was fighting my case. Every day I was working out, reading, writing. I was like connecting on a spiritual level. I was just going through such a metamorphosis that my mindset was... I'm going to do this in prison and I'm going to turn this seven years into the most positive, productive years of my life. Wow. And I'm going to come out and I'm going to be able to do anything I want with my life. Come on. And that was my mindset. So I took the plea deal and that's what I went into prison thinking like, I'm going to do whatever I can to just better myself every day. I'm not going to go backwards. I'm going to keep moving forward and I'm going to use this time of incarceration as an opportunity. Yeah. And I'm going to leverage this adversity in my favor long term. Wow. And you spent 2,008 days yeah. incarcerated? Yeah. I ended up doing a little over five and a half years. I got time off my sentence for, I got college degrees while I was incarcerated. I did all the self-help groups you could imagine. And we're but, talking about Toastmasters yeah, so before I did this. AA, Toastmasters, everything that they offered, I took advantage of. And it was, at first, you know, I was in um, like a reception center. So when you go to prison initially in California, they put you in a reception center where you're still locked down. So for the first year of my incarceration, I was locked down 24-7 pretty much. Mm. But it was a good thing because it gave me time to really figure out who I was and who I wanted to be. Yeah. And just so many hours upon hours thinking, reflecting. What did a day look right. like being in lockdown? Yeah, so you wake up early. I would wake up before the sun would get up. Um, I have a specific morning routine of prayer, meditation. I would journal. Those were the most profound moments of my life because I would just sit there on my bunk with nowhere to go and nothing to do. And when you're just bored and you sit there and you're forced to just be in that moment, you, you start to build this connection. For me, it was a spiritual connection. Wow. It was something beyond me. Yeah. You know, something guiding me. I had to believe and I had to have faith that somehow, some way, things could get better or that experience was happening for a reason. Wow. But I chose to believe that. Yeah. Because the alternative was miserable. Right. Like you would have withered away and died in that cell, but instead you did the exact opposite and you actually fortified yourself through that. Exactly. Exactly. And then from there, you get really good at, at distracting yourself. So the, it starts off by trying to distract yourself and stay busy every day. So you can just get through the day. Because if you sit there idly all day, anxiety, stress, the fear of the unknown in the future, it starts to get to you. Yeah. So after I would have that morning, you know, self reflection time, I would go into my workout. And the workout is a way that, to combat the stress. And what I found through exercise is, man, I started feeling like high, high on endorphins. Yeah. I started feeling empowered. I started feeling energy. I'd get clarity and thoughts about the future. So I love my exercise routine. And it was also a way for me to show gratitude. Like I'm incarcerated. I have all this stuff working against me, but I have arms and legs. Mm. My heart's beating. I'm alive. Like I'm going to use my body today. I'm going to push myself because I get to do this right now. Yeah. And so every day when I was working out, I'd remind myself, I'm so blessed. I have the function of my body. Some people are in wheelchairs. Some people can't run. Some people can't work out. And then I would either write letters home or read a book. And I would spend hours reading and writing. And when I got to prison, they offered college courses. So then my time was broken up a little more. 
I would do my college studies. I might get sent to a self-help group later in the day. But every day it was the same thing. My morning routine, my exercise, and then reading and writing. Every day for five years straight. Wow. So I got all the personal development books you can imagine sent in. Books on exercise science, anatomy, physiology, because I was really interested in that. And then I took co uh, college courses on biology, psychology. I got four associate's degrees in that time. Come on. Yeah, so every day I was just studying and reading and writing. Like, I was obsessed because I saw that as a way to not only distract myself initially and keep busy, but then it was something I looked forward to. Yeah. And I remember being in jail or in prison, like, really happy. Wow. And looking forward to getting back to my cell or getting back to the dorm and reading my book or looking forward to the paper I was going to write. Yeah. And I was just so immersed in this world of self-discovery and personal development that it helped me to forget about all the pain of the past. It was like healing me because I was moving forward towards something better. Mm. And so the coolest thing was other guys started to notice me. And they started to ask me questions about my workouts. Or they started to ask me questions about how I was disciplined or why I was so positive. Like, Sean, why are you so happy in here? You shouldn't be that way, you know? Yeah. And I started talking to a lot of these guys and explaining to them what I was doing, that I had this vision of who I wanted to be after prison, and that that was just temporary. Like, I saw my life beyond the walls. Mm. And a lot of them, they couldn't see anything other than the moment. Right. And they were suffering. They were still battling addiction. They were still wounded from the past. They didn't do anything day to day to build themselves up. So they were just stuck. And so during the course of my time incarcerated, I started mentoring dozens of other guys. Wow. Showing them the books I was reading, working out with them every day. So you're mentoring these guys in prison. Yeah. Wow. And the coolest thing was I saw a lot of those guys start to change their demeanor, their energy, their attitude. They started to have a little more confidence. And then they started talking differently about their life after prison. Like, maybe I could do this other thing. Maybe I'm not going to go back to my old neighborhood. Hey, I want to be sober. I want to be a counselor. I want to do what you're doing, Sean. And I saw them change before my eyes. And in that moment, that's when I knew this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Come on. When I get out of prison, I'm going to be of service. I'm going to help people. I'm going to change people's lives. And the coolest thing was I was just showing them and talking to them about the things I was doing. And it started changing their lives. And so that's when I found my purpose. And a lot of people will say, like, hey, what's your purpose, Cody? Like, how do you know when you find your purpose? Yeah. And I always tell people, you just got to focus on becoming your best self. Don't think too much about what my purpose is. What should I do? Start focusing on things every day that build you up and that help you to feel good about your life and who you are. Yeah. And over time, your purpose is unveiled to you. It's not something you just find the first time you try or, like, you can't just think about it and suddenly come up with the answer. It's life experience that guides you. And yeah. so for me, when I got out of prison, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people. I wanted to speak on stages. I already had the idea to write my book. And you were visualizing that. Every day. The visualization is so powerful. Every morning I'd get up and I would just pray as long as it took me to find that source of gratitude and energy. Like some mornings you wake up in prison and it's the worst feeling, the most negative energy, the most debilitating emotions. Like you're just in pain, man, because you miss your family. You miss freedom. You miss all the little things that we take for granted out here. Yeah. Just being able to get up and walk out of my room, my cell, and go do whatever I wanted, I didn't have that luxury. You wake up in a six-byte cell, and there's another person, in, and you're just stuck in this jail cell. So some days were, were very difficult. And I developed routines, though, that would elevate me beyond that low emotional state. Yeah. And this is what a lot of people struggle with out here. When they're having a bad day or they feel a certain type of way, like a negative emotion, they don't know how to elevate beyond that. They stay stuck in it, right? Or they complain about it. Or they just, they don't do anything. Or they turn to a vice like food, porn, drugs, right. alcohol, whatever it is. But then you're compromised for the whole day. Mm. And you bring that person into the world. Yeah. So what I teach a lot of people now, the guys I work with and coach, is what I did for myself. It's self-mastery. It's when you're feeling that way, you have to have recourse, whether it's prayer and meditation, whether it's exercise, whether it's journaling, like there's so many tools and resources that people just don't utilize and they try to like grit their way through. They try to willpower their way through it and it doesn't work. Yeah. So for me, I would get up in the morning, I would just tap into that gratitude. That was like my-, my that, that was your source. That was my life. That allowed you to fight that. And I never felt alone in prison, not one day, because- I, I had a spiritual connection. Well, I God. believe you weren't. He was with you the entire time. The whole, I mean, I was there because God put me there. I would be dead right now if I didn't go to prison. Like, it saved my life. Yeah. I would. I'm so lucky I didn't overdose that, I mean, a month before, I was driving home to go work. It was like 5 in the morning. I had been up all night drinking, and I flipped my car. I crashed into the side of a mountain. I fell asleep, flipped my car, and skidded for about 100 yards, and then Luckily, I didn't get hurt, but the road I was on was a windy road, and there was a lake, and I could have easily hit the guardrail and flipped over and found myself 
in a lake. Yeah, like, I mean, rejection the, is redirection, right? At the, the course you were heading on, yeah. there's a good chance you want to be with us today. Very likely. And it's almost like, man, it's, it's crazy. I sit here and I hear you tell this, and I'm like, God, that is crazy. Like, you put this man in prison for seven years, but then I even look in the Word and I look at Joseph and the time that he spent in prison— then he became second in command to Pharaoh, was the only one above him and ruler over all of Egypt, made all of the decisions. And I see a similar story with you. You know, God used that time for you to prepare you for what to, was to come. And, and it's well, one thing that's interesting, and I think some people, and we're going to dive into this because you wrote a book on this, but they're living in their own prison. They're not actually incarcerated in a prison. But they live in a prison every single day, and it's inside of their mind. And, you know, you talked about how some people, like, stay in that place, and they go to porn, and they go to addiction, they go to this and that. But somehow, in this time period, you were able to discipline yourself and break that and continue to live that still to this day. What would you say to that man right now? He's probably driving in his car. He's listening to this podcast, but he's in his own prison cell. What would you say to him? Yeah, well, first of all, I think most people don't have the awareness to even realize that, like, they've done it to themselves. Like, they're stuck in this mental prison that they've created. Mm. And so what saved my life was, number one, like, eliminating the things that had led to that set of circumstances. So getting sober, like, getting away from my toxic relationships, these things were forced initially. But it helped me so much because now I was just in a new environment and I had time to think about who I was and what I wanted to do in life. So for anyone listening, the first step for you would be write down who you want to be and like what you no longer want in your life. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's just as important to know what we don't want as it is to know who we want to be. Because a lot of times we don't know what that ultimate life looks like. You know, people don't have clarity. So start with what do you want to eliminate? But then what changed my life was I started to do things every day that helped me to feel proud of who I was. And I hadn't felt that way since I was a kid. That's so good. And it was the smallest, most simplest things, doing burpees in my cell, writing letters back home and actually like trying to write my letters with good penmanship and spelling and then reading. And here's the thing. One of the first things that happened to me that really like it really changed my life in a profound way. I was in my cell and I had a cellmate at the time and I'd be writing these letters back home. And I had started to try to improve my letters because my dad actually wrote me back and he's like, hey, your spelling's really bad. He wasn't trying to make fun of me or anything. He was trying to help me improve, but he was start, he wrote, he sent me my own letter back and he circled all these like words. Like a teacher pointing yeah. out like, hey, these are the grammatical errors. And he knew I had time on my hands. So I think he was trying to help me, right? But um, so I started trying to write these letters perfectly with perfect penmanship, not one misspelled word. But at the time I wasn't good at spelling at all. And so I kept asking my cellmate, how do you spell this word? How do you spell that word? And one day he just picked up this little pocket dictionary and threw it and hit me in the shoulder. And he goes, look it up. And in that moment, I was kind of mad at him, but I thought, okay, watch this. Like, I'm going to take on that challenge. And so every day when I was writing letters back home, I would go through my little pocket dictionary. I'd spell every word perfectly. I would take like two hours to write these letters. They were just flawless, perfect penmanship. Then when I would be reading a book um, later in the day, sitting on my bunk, any word I came across I didn't know the definition or meaning of, I looked it up and I started keeping a list, like a vocabulary list. Oh, wow. And then every night I would study that list and memorize the words and their definition. And I started using them in my letters back home. And in a very short period of time, my penmanship, uh, my grammar, everything evolved drastically. I mean, my dad actually wrote me a letter back going, hey, who's writing your letters for you? Like, you're, you sound really good. You could see a big difference in your writing. And so that moment was so empowering for me because prior to that, I thought I lacked intelligence. I knew I was good in social settings. I can make friends. Yeah. I knew I was athletic, and I believed in myself in those areas. But I thought I lacked intellect. Mm. And it wasn't that I lacked intellect. I just never challenged or pushed myself to excel in school. I got bored. I didn't care about studying. you know. And I didn't even go to school, really. So in that moment, it showed me that I could change things about myself that I thought were concrete and true, and I could transform and change who I was. That's with so just, good. With just effort and being willing to get out of my comfort zone. Because even picking up that dictionary, it was scary for me. As, tr as funny as that might sound to the, the listeners, it was scary for me to get out of my comfort zone because what if I try and I fail? What if I'm really dumb and lack the intellect? Like I had to. Right. I like most to, people won't even pick the dictionary up because they're like, like, well, if I find out I'm stupid and it just affirms to me this exactly. negative thing that I already think about myself. 
Exactly. It's a metaphor for life. It's changing is scary for everyone. The greatest emotion that humans possess, the most strongest, is fear, and particularly fear of the unknown. Because we have this thing in our head where we always expect it to go bad. We always think that we're not good enough. We always worry about what other people are going to say. And that's why most people don't change or they stay stuck. So if you're listening to this, I want you to know most likely you're much more capable than you realize. And oftentimes on this journey to improve, you are going to fail. But that failure isn't the end. It's just a learning lesson. And you can take that lesson and apply it to your next effort and you're going to get better and better and better as you go. And that's what I learned. So picking up that pocket dictionary led to me having the courage and confidence to enroll in college courses in prison. And I remember I almost didn't do it. I was scared. I'm like, oh, why am I going to take college courses? Like, what is it even going to do to better me? What if I fail? What if I'm not good at it? But I said, no, like, I was on this path of improving myself and I knew I had to yeah. keep facing my fears and keep taking action. So I enrolled in college courses and I got four associate's degrees. And I studied psychology, business, social and behavioral sciences. I fell in love with reading, with writing. Yeah. And I actually got a letter back from one of my teachers. And they were astounded that I was in prison. And they're like, you turned in your paper. Uh, it was our final paper for one of the classes. And she said it was the best paper out of anybody that she got. Wow. Like, I can't believe you're in prison. There's this, this guy incredible. that couldn't even write or spell well. Yeah. Now the number one paper in your class. Yeah. And so to take it a step further, when I got out of prison, I knew I wanted to share my story and write a book. So I wrote a book and it became a bestseller on Amazon. And tell us what that book is. Uh, it's Prison of Your Own. You can find it on Amazon. Type in Prison of Your Own. You'll see it pop up. It's a picture of me in handcuffs. I would have brought, I'm going to give you a copy. I would have brought you one. But just looking back on all that, like I started by just picking up that pocket dictionary. And again, it's, it's symbolic of the journey that we all go on. When you just are willing to face your fears, be honest with yourself and take action despite how you feel or what you think could go wrong and you keep moving forward, amazing things transpire in your life and new opportunities, new doors open up for you down the road and you'll accomplish stuff in your life that you never imagined that you would achieve. And it's incredible. And that happens in like, I mean, let's go back to Toastmasters. The way that I enrolled in Toastmasters in prison was I was in a drug program in prison. If you have priors for drugs and alcohol, like I had a DUI when I was 19, they automatically put you in a drug program because basically they have to fill those seats. But what it did is it got me out of my cell every day. So I was going to this program and I'm with all these other inmates who do not want to be there. They're combative. They're, they're mean. They're rude. Like they would get sent back to their cells. There would be lockdowns for all kinds of stuff. So it was not a good environment, but I wanted to use it to my advantage. And I wanted to start, you know, talking about sobriety. I wanted to be sober for the rest of my life. I wanted to use it in a way that was going to push me forward. So I remember one day they said, hey, is there any volunteers to go up on the podium and talk about your past drug use and your history with drugs and alcohol? And I said, I'll do it. So I got up in front of all these inmates sitting in their chairs, covered in tattoos, just mean mugging me, not happy to be there. And man, I choked. I couldn't even share my own story. Mm. I got nervous. You know, my face got red, my voice was quivering, and I just kind of got through it. But then I went and sat back down. A couple of the guys I knew, like, hey, Sean, what happened, man? You choked up there. Like, why are you all nervous, you know? And that was the first time I'd ever spoke in front of people. And for a lot of individuals, like, public speaking is really scary. But in that moment, I told myself, I'm not going to let this fear that I have, like, stop me. Yeah. I need to speak more. I just felt it. In like, my that's heart. not ever going to happen to me again. Exactly. That's what I told myself. I know myself. that feeling. And so, in that program, I started raising my hand anytime there was a question asked. And I started getting more comfortable uh, speaking and sharing in front of people. And then, um, you know, fast forward like a couple years, I got moved to a new prison and they had Toastmasters. And the first time I went, I didn't know what to expect. And I went there and I was shocked to see how eloquent the speakers were. Like, these were guys in prison that you're sitting next to in the chow hall, that you never expect to be that good at articulating the message. And yeah. They were powerful. And they were they were on Did point. you guys write down the critique on the paper and fold it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. We did all that. And so I remember I um, rehearsed my first speech, you know, and I gave it. And it was pretty good. It was a lot better. I got through the speech. And then each month I started doing them. And I started getting better and better and better and more comfortable. And so that's when the seed was planted that I want to come home and I want to share my story and my message uh, to an audience. Like, I want to captivate an audience from stage. I want to hit the biggest stages in the world. I got something in my heart I need people to hear and feel. And I just had this vision Powerful. of being on stage, captivating an audience with my message. So fast forward from those moments to now, and I've been able to do that. I've been able to speak with Ed Milet, Jesse Itzler, Tim Story, all these incredible speakers, Gary Brecka, and I'm fulfilling that vision. And so if you're listening to this, you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years or five years from now. 
I just got out of prison five years ago. But 10 years ago, I was already envisioning these moments and I was just willing to work towards them. I didn't try to speed up time. I didn't think that, you know, if I didn't make it in the next year that I was going to quit. Like I just kept going. And so it's incredible what can happen if you envision the life that you want and you're willing to work towards it. Or you can just doubt yourself and not take action five years from now you'll probably be in the same position you are right now. Yeah, and that's most people. It is. Most people listening to this right now, and it breaks my heart. They're going to be in the same place in five years. And, and it's interesting when you ask a lot of people, hey, where do, you, where do you want your life to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now? A lot of people don't even have an answer ready to go. Yeah. They don't even think about it. They're lost in, in the busyness of the world and society and conformity. There's a couple things that I saw in your story. And one of the things, you mentioned the word obsessed. Every single person that sat in that chair has a very two two things in common. For one, they believe in themselves and they believe in what they're doing. But the second thing is they're obsessed. You're obsessed with the calling that God has on your life. You're obsessed with impacting people's lives. You had that even in prison. That's so rare, man. Like yeah. my dad just got out of prison. My dad was also obsessed. My dad also prioritized his routine, his physical health. He went the law route. So he actually has freed over 50-something inmates writing their legal briefs over 29 years in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Why? Because he needed something to stay focused on. He needed to visualize getting out the day that he's now having, which is a crazy moment for our family. But he was obsessed. I could even hear it when I talked to him. My dad wasn't lost. He was obsessed. But so many people, they don't have that. They're lost, man, but you had that. And then there was another thing that I just want to drop this because I, I want these guys to catch this. Sean, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to you talk, and I'm like, that's gold, that's gold, that's gold, that's gold. But some people aren't catching it, and I want them to catch it. Here's another thing. You played your own game. You played your own game in prison. Most men can't even play their own game outside of prison. But yet, somehow, you mastered the game of playing Sean. And I think so many people don't know how to play their own game. You're still playing it. There's nothing, I can already see it. There's nothing I could say to throw you off your game. Because you're playing your own game. You're not worried about what Cody says because you're playing Sean's game every single day. And I would love you to speak to that because you've somehow figured it out. And less than 1% of people figure out how to play their own game. Yeah, that's powerful, man. I mean, if I hadn't gone to prison, like I said earlier, I wouldn't be here. Um, prison gave me awareness and time to really be honest with myself in a way I never had in my life. Yeah. And I knew definitively in those moments who I wanted to be. And I just saw that I had gone such an opposite direction from that person. And it ate, it ate away at me, man, because I, I had so much regret for not living up to this potential that I knew I possessed. I had so much regret for wasting my life. It was the worst pain I'd ever known. Mm. And at that point, I thought I was doing life in prison. And I thought my life was over. And it was, I mean, imagine like a lot of you guys listening, you're going to get to later years in your life and you're going to realize, I wish I would have changed a long time ago. I wish I would have done that thing that I was supposed to do 10 years ago. Like you can do that now. The worst feeling in the world is when you get to the end of your life and you wish you had a do over. Come on. And you're not going to get that chance. And I did. So I'm on this mission to reach as many people as I can to get them to start thinking on a deeper level about how you're living. And is this what you really want? And you need to know that you are creating your outcomes. You're in control. So if you don't like what you're doing now, if you don't like your outcomes, if you don't like your results, you have to start taking action now. And it's not going to change overnight, but down the road, it will. So for me, I know what's at stake. And a lot of people don't. I know that feeling of wishing that I could have lived my life differently. And God gave me a second chance. So now every day, I'm all in. Like nothing will deter me. Nothing will stop me. I'm obsessed with living the ultimate life being the best dad, being a leader, being the best version of myself I could ever be and facing my fears and just going to this, this level in life that I never thought was possible. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I know how precious it is and I know how quickly it can be taken away. That's so good. And it's choose your heart. You're either going to pay the price of discipline now or the price of regret later. And every single day we're faced with choice, even doing this podcast, we have to have discipline to show up here and to do this thing. Right, I have to have discipline to finance this thing, to, to reach out and ask a guy like Sean, hey, would you come on the podcast when he could tell me no? So many different things in life and forks and decisions that we have to make every day, but it's the pain of discipline up front or the pain of regret later. What would have happened if I just tried? What would have happened if I just overcame my fear and actually went for it? And the worst thing that'll happen is it doesn't go that good. And that's okay because I'll learn from 
not going that good and I'll get better and I'll get better and I'll get better. But I want to segue now because you're, dude, I mean, you're, you're making waves, bro. Like you were just speaking on stage with Brendan Burchard. You're getting on big stages. Like you're, you're, you're like a rocket taking off right now, impacting lives all around the world. And you're doing some crazy work in your company. And I want to give opportunity for you to speak to that work that you're doing. Can you tell us more about your company? the heart behind it, the mission behind it, and what you're doing. Yeah, I love it. So this all started with just wanting to help people change and be of service. And so I started doing that right when I got out of prison. I literally, within two months, had a job working with, for a friend as a personal trainer. And mm -hmm. I knew that was just a stepping stone into the industry I wanted to be in, which is personal development. So six months after that, I started my own fitness company, and I was going to different gyms, training people all over the, uh, the county. Then COVID shut everything down. Mm. So during COVID, I pivoted and took my business online. And that's when I really embraced the role of life coach. I'm not just a fitness guy. I mean, this is mindset, fitness, how you show up in your relationships. It's everything. It's multifaceted. And so I started telling my story online and it started taking off and catching traction with people. And this is in a time when people were battling depression, anxiety, addiction, relapse. It. it was through the roof. So it really resonated with people. So fast forward five years. Now my company is unstoppable. Hashtag 365 MFR. And that's a long name, but it's specific and it's authentic to me. Unstoppable is my mindset that I cultivated in prison. The 365 means that your intention every day is to show up as your best self. Like, who is that man that God is calling you to be? We all have that vision. Yeah. If you don't, you need to spend some time really thinking on a deeper level. But I know that most people have a feeling inside of them of who they want to be. But you're sabotaging yourself. You sleep in when you say you want to get up. You drink when you say you want to be sober. You're smoking. You're watching TV when you want to be reading. You're not paying attention to your kids. Like, you have the answers, but you're not showing up as that person. So the intention is to be your best self every day in everything that you do. That's the standard. Yeah. When we talk about standards, that's the standard. The MFR is, are you that motherfucker? Like, are you being that guy that you know you should Come be? Come on. We're going to bring a little edge. We have to have that intensity in life. We're not just going to go through life nonchalant, casual. Like, you're here for a purpose, and you're here for a limited amount of time. Let's make this journey count. So that's a personal development program, and we help guys with their fitness, with their mindset, their nutrition, and we have a community. It's not just me. I have two other coaches. I have an, uh, a couple other employees, and we have hundreds of guys that are coming together to support each other. Yeah. Every day on my app that I have, we just are flooded with comments of guys supporting each other, encouraging each other, going to the gym, talking about their weekend, showing pictures, and now it's a brotherhood. Yeah. So it's not just me. It's all these other men, and I get fired up getting to see these guys change. I feed off that energy. You know what yeah. I mean? And so I host in-person events every so often, like we're doing one in Puerto Rico this month where we're going to have 10 to 15 of my guys – fly out and people who aren't even in my program that just want to grow. They want to change. They yeah. want that. Impact. They want to be in proximity to you and the other guys. And that's what happens when you get around people who are achieving at a high level. You see what that looks like. You feel it. And we're going to push you, man. We're going to break through some, some limiting beliefs, these thresholds that are holding you back in your life. Like we're going to just plow through that stuff and show you what you're capable of in real time. And being in different environments and around different people is such a catalyst for growth. Because it shifts your perspective instantaneously, you know? So I love the in-person stuff. Yeah. Um, and then just recently, I started doing coaching on how to build your brand online, how to be heard and seen more, how to build a coaching program like I have. Because I had so many guys reaching out to me, asking me, Sean, how have you been able to do this online since you came home from prison? Like, what are you doing? Like, do you have another job? How do you support your family? Yeah. You know, I'm like, no, this is what I do. I do this full time. Uh, I'll show you. So I started that coaching program. It's called Unstoppable Influence. I have about 12 guys in it right now who are Come coaches, uh, guys in sales, guys that just want to be seen and heard more to create opportunities and build relationships online. So those are the, a lot of the guys that come to the masterminds or come to the speaking events I'm at because they want to see what that looks like. They want to learn from the best. And I can make introductions. You know, I've been able to build powerful relationships with guys like Andy Elliott, Bradley, like all these people online that are crushing it because those are the guys I want to learn from. I yeah. want to be around them. I want to see what they're doing. I want to pick their brains and success leaves clues, right? So if you want to be successful, get around the people that are doing it on a big level and then put your own twist on it. Like use your story, use your uniqueness, be authentic, but you can see what's working for other people and you apply it and you fast track to your goals. Yeah. So, you know, those are the things I'm doing, coaching, personal development, social media and business marketing, and then the masterminds and the speaking. I mean, that my family is my world right now. That's my purpose is to be that man uh, every day. And I'm just super grateful, man, that I get to have these opportunities. Yeah. And you're just getting started. Just getting started, man. I mean, 
this year has been a breakthrough year for me, but this is just a glimpse of what's possible and what we're going to do and achieve. Like my goal is to have the number one personal development program in the world, be the top speaker in the Come world. On. Like I'm, I'm going for it. I'm all in because I have one life and I have this passion. I have this desire in my heart to be the best. And I'm going to show people what's possible every day. And I have no doubt you're going to get there. I mean, even from the visualization you had in prison, the discipline, the obedience, the work ethic, the way that you work there, you're now working out here. And you can just see that trajectory. I could see it on your life. So I have no doubt you're going to do it. So there's a couple of things while you're talking. I got a really cool download for a question. I was like, oh, this could be an interesting one. You're working with all these men. You know, you started with fitness. Then you learned, wow, these guys need so much more than fitness, right? They need to work on this. They need to work on their mindset. What are some of the, like, say the top one or two issues that you're encountering with these men that you just kind of see, right? Because when you start coaching, you start working with people, you start seeing, wow, this is kind of common. A lot of these guys struggle with this. What is something that you're seeing in these men and how are you helping them overcome it? Yeah, that's a great question. So negative self-talk and just not believing in themselves. That's it. So when they get around other guys who they can relate to, who might be a little further ahead than them on the journey, they see what's possible. And the thing that I'm able to do with these guys is breathe belief into them. Like I, I help them to see what's possible. You know, I, I got to get them to believe in themselves. So I transfer that confidence and that conviction in the way I speak to them. And I use my story to show them what's possible. Like you guys, look what I've been able to do in my own life. I promise you, you can do this too. So the working out every day, the developing of the routines, it starts to build that belief in them. And in a short period of time, when they're losing some weight, they're consistent in their routine, they start to develop confidence, like, man, I'm doing it. Yeah. And so we just got to keep growing that belief, right? And over time, the self-talk improves. And then, you know, their perspective of what's possible in their life starts to transform. So it, that it's that right there. It's the negative self-talk because they're not doing anything they're proud of. Yeah. And we change that. And then the lack of belief in themselves because they have – you know, uh, an extended period of time of just not showing up as the person they want to be. Would you say it's impossible to become the best version of yourself if you lack confidence? Absolutely. And you're never going to be your best self. So let's just get that like out of the way. You're never going to be your best self. It's a never ending journey. And that's the thing that excites me. I remember in prison all those years ago, I got so excited realizing my growth is never complete. Mm. And some people get daunted by that. But my perspective is I get to keep improving and seeing who I can become year after year. Yeah. And if you don't have confidence in yourself, you're not going to take action. You're not going to push through fears. You're not going to go after the bigger goals in life. You're going to stay stuck. So confidence is a superpower. You have to develop it. And this is something you need to sharpen every day. That's why my program or my company has the 365 in it. Because I don't sleep in on Sundays. I don't skip my workouts on a holiday. I don't let a day or the name of a day or any like thing that's going on in that day stop me from showing up intentional as my best self. I still work my mind, my body. I'm showing up grateful. I'm showing up as my best self. And too many people take days off. They're consistently inconsistent. And they wonder why they don't mm, feel the way they want to feel. Go there. Yeah. Right? They let that momentum die. They don't believe in themselves because they know their subconscious mind knows that they just missed 200 days this year of showing up as the person they say they want to be. Come on. So it doesn't mean you have to go out and run marathons every day. You don't have to get up at 4 a.m. every day. You don't have to like have this crazy regimen and routine, but you have to be intentional with how you live. You have to have a plan of how you're showing up the next day. You have to follow through and then you have to analyze it. And so what I teach my guys is let's create a 10 out of 10 day. Next Wednesday, you're working, you have a normal, typical day. But what would make that day the best Wednesday that you've ever had? Like, I'm not saying you're going to hit the lotto. I'm not saying that you're going to Disneyland with the kids, whatever you like to do. But, like, when you go to sleep at night, I want you to have that feeling uh, thinking, man, I couldn't have lived this day any better. I want you to have pride in how you lived and how you showed up. I want you to feel grateful for your life. So what do we have to do to get you to that point? Come and on. The thing is, I was going to sleep in jail every night feeling immensely proud of who I was. I couldn't believe it. I was going to sleep at night just loving who I was becoming. And it was the best feeling in the world. And I never had that feeling in my entire life. And it showed me you don't need to be in a mansion. You don't need a bunch of money. You don't need to have these massive milestones to feel that emotional or that internal state. You just have to align your thoughts and your actions with somebody that you actually want to be that you're proud of. Right? And so for a lot of guys. You guys catching this? This yeah, is fire. For a lot of guys, it's just get up when you know you should. Get up a little earlier when your damn alarm clock goes off. Don't snooze it. You're not a little kid. Okay. Go to the gym and work out and move your body. You're going to feel better after you get those endorphins going. You get that first win of the day. Then throughout the day, don't do anything that sabotages yourself, okay? 
don't drink if you know you shouldn't drink. Don't abuse food like most people do. Like have a plan for how you're going to eat to fuel your mind and body, right, to achieve your goals. And just start having a day where you have these little milestones that you can check those boxes. And then when you go home, be present with your family. Don't be on your phone. Like you know what you need to do, right? Yeah. If you do that, just give me one day and tell me. Like I want you to do that tomorrow, okay, or on Monday. And then when you go to sleep at night, pay attention to how you feel. You're going to feel so good and proud of yourself. You're like, damn, I, I did it today. I got crushed today. Yeah, and what I also teach my guys is as you're going to bed, have a little uh, replay and a recap of your day. Rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, right? So first we set that standard. What does a 10 out of 10 day look like given all your roles and responsibilities and your goals and who you want to become? Just what does that day look like? And then when you go to sleep, think about it. Was today a 5 out of 10? Was today a 6 out of 10? Give yourself a score and then ask yourself, what could I have done differently to make that a 10 out of 10 day? And that awareness is going to serve you going into the following day. And the more that you do this, you're going to have much more awareness and you're going to start to develop self-control over how you're living each and every day. So that coupled with being intentional, it's a game changer for most men. Come and this on. is awareness that most people just don't have or apply in their lives. That's so good. And, and what I love about what you're dropping right now, I think, think there's a lot of say this affirmation and do this thing to be confident. But what you're saying is go do the thing you said you were going to do to be the man you want to be. And you'll get confidence from that. Yeah. There's, like, a, there's a big misconception with affirmations and like a lot of stuff that people say is going to change your life. Most of it doesn't work if you're not taking action. In fact, action is the most important component of you changing your life. Because without the action, you don't actually believe you're changing. You don't see change. You don't feel the change or the growth taking place. So, you know, affirmations are like pre-workout, right? But you going lifting the weights is what actually gets you the results. I like that analogy. Right? The, the affirmations don't do anything if you're not taking action. That if you're, you if you're not good. stepping in the arena, right? Like there's, a, there's two things I want to bring up. There's a poem, I don't know if you ever heard it, called Man in the Mirror. I don't know if you ever heard that, but the concept of it is that you can lie to the whole world. You can show up on social media, post the videos, do this and that, but you can't lie to the man in the mirror. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we all have to look at the man that looks us back in the mirror. You know if you gave 100% that so day. So good. You know if you, and, and here's the thing. If you look at yourself in the mirror, and I had this reality check years ago, and I know that I'm trying to fool the world, but I can't fool me. I'm not confident. Inside of me, there's an insecurity knowing that I'm not being the best man that I can be. But I'll tell you what, when you begin to align those actions with that, when I begin to tell the world, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm gonna do, and my actions align with that, and I look at that man there, I'm like, fuck yeah, we are. Yeah, because every so day good. I'm confident. That's so good. I met so many people that I saw on social media, and when I met them in person, I was like, man, you're not the guy that you portray yourself to be. Yeah. But here's the thing, when I was in jail, I was taking so much action every day. Like, this sounds crazy to people, but I was. Like, go do a thousand burpees and tell me how you feel after. I was doing that every day. I would do a thousand push-ups and a thousand squats in the morning before breakfast while it was still dark out while everyone in the dorm slept. And my mindset, my self-talk was like, I'm changing my life. I'm hungry. I'm motivated. I'm outworking everyone. Then I'd be reading books every day, studying, writing. I was obsessed with my personal development and my growth. So nobody could take that feeling from me. It didn't matter that I was confined and incarcerated. The guards couldn't take it. The judge. Nobody could take that feeling that I was cultivating about myself away. It's like Goggins, and I think, calls it taking souls. When I discovered that that's when I became unstoppable and that's what drove me every day and the thing that drove me through those 2008 days was I didn't want to let that spark die mm. once it was ignited my greatest fear and I would have nightmares about this that I would wake up one day and that I would want to use drugs and alcohol or I'd wake up one day and that gratitude and that spark for life would suddenly diminish so every day I had to spark it I had to ignite it and that's why those daily actions became habitual and became who I am today because I still keep that feeling alive every day. I can't let a day pass where I just hope to feel the way I want to feel, where I hope to be sober, where I hope to be the best dad. I cultivate the man that I need to be through those daily actions from the moment I open my eyes. Sean. You're dropping some fire, bro. This is good, and I'm catching it, and I hope other people are catching it. Yeah, and you, you guys feel it. It's the thing, like, you hear people talk all the time and say stuff, but I want you to feel what I'm saying. Mm. If you don't feel it, it's because I'm not the real deal. Like, I haven't actually done what I, I'm talking about. And you see a lot of people who say the right things, to, uh, do the affirmations, you know, do this, do that, but they're not really the person internally that they want to portray to be, yeah. so you don't feel it. Right? I want to transfer energy and belief to you in such a way where it like gets you feeling it and, and you want to take action. You want to be a better man. Like You know there's more out there for you and you make that decision right then and they're like, I'm going to take my life to the next level. 
Like I felt that I need to go bigger. I need to go harder. People need me. They need to hear me. They need to see me. They need to feel my presence. That's like when you're coaching and being a leader at a high level, when you speak to people and they feel it in their heart and soul. Mm. Like that's the goal. There's a different level of conviction yes. and belief that you have when you live it, not just say it. And I feel that from you. Well, as we come to the end of this podcast, because we're running out of time here, I just had a crazy question pop in my mind I want to ask you. If Sean today... Sean sitting in that chair right now could go walk up to Sean one week before, you know, you got falsely accused and had to go to prison for over five years of your life. What would you say to Sean at 23 years old one week before that happens? Yeah, people always ask me, like, what would you tell your younger self? And I firmly believe I had to go through being incarcerated, everything that I went through to get to this point in my life. I know I did. That young man, one thing, it would probably be the same thing my uncle told me when I was facing life. He would come to visit me in jail. And there was nothing he could tell me. And the only thing he would say is, Sean, this too shall pass. And in that moment, I was like, man, that's all you got for me? Like, I need something else. You know, I'm, I'm suffering here. I'm struggling. But what he was telling me is like, hey, sometimes there's no easy way around it. You got to get through it, right? And you go through the hardships. You go through the adversity. You face up for your mistakes or what you did wrong. Like, that's when you grow the most. Yeah. You know, so I would have told him, hey, get ready because you're going to have a, a dark stretch here for a while. But if you don't quit and give up and you fight every day, you're going to get out and shine in the light, man. That's good, man. That's so good. And, and the fire refines you. It does. The fire burns the impurities out of you. Yeah. Well, and here, real quick, one more thing. If you're a guy who, you don't have to go to prison. You don't have to get divorced. You don't have to lose your job. But you have to do things every day that are difficult and that challenge you in such a way where you're like, damn, I did that. Like, go sign up for that marathon. Get in the cold plunge, get in the sauna, go to the gym, start developing these disciplines in your life. And it's going to sharpen you in such a way where you feel alive. And too many of you are going through your days where you don't feel alive. You're just going through the motion. You complain, you're half-assing your life and it's going to be over before you know it. So start finding ways to feel alive and watch you become by developing yourself in that way. Come on, Sean Crane, what's next for you, bro? We're going to hit the biggest stages in the world, man. We're going to grow the coaching program to serve men who are struggling all over. And it's not just about me telling you what I think you should do. I want you to figure out within yourself who you want to be. And then I want to support you to become that man. That's what our whole mission is. So, I mean, in Austin, Texas, at the end of September, we're speaking at one of the biggest events in the year. Tim Grover is going to be there. Marcus Luttrell from Lone Survivor. Wow. Rob Bailey perform is performing. It's Victor Rancor's event, so check that out. Uh, just, man, we want to make a massive impact on the world. And because... I know what's at stake for so many people. I'm going to keep sharing this message and keep showing up, speak my truth, speak from my heart, and just be that authentic version of myself that I always wanted to be. And here's the thing. When you just do the right thing and you just show up and you spread that positive energy and that message, like it's incredible what happens, but your whole life transforms. Yeah. And, and you get to do these things and meet people and be here speaking to guys like you. And I love this because I hope one person hears this or everybody that listens and they're compelled to go above and beyond and be better versions of themselves. And if we all do that collectively, like we raise the standards in society and people are more fulfilled, they're doing things they love, they're happier, they're kinder to each other, and it's going to be a better world for our children to grow up in. That's so good. And it's, it's crazy because even today, man, like I'm at this camp the last four days. Like, dude, I'm exhausted, right? These kids run me ragged and I'm pouring into them everything that I have. And we get in the car and my mindset shifts. It's time to go to the studio. It's time to crush this thing, right? And Esther's looking at me like, dude, you're crazy. And I'm like, I know who suffers if I don't show up 100% today. And thank you for showing up the way that you show up. Because there are people whose lives wouldn't get changed today if you didn't show up in the way that you show up. So that's powerful. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Appreciate, you know, you having me here. And obviously we connected for a reason. Like we, we share very similar beliefs, values even life experience. And so that's what happens. Like when you guys go out and just go into that unknown, right? You face your fears, you get out of your comfort zone. That's where your dreams are made. That's where the person you want to be is born. But by you just staying in the same environment, being comfortable, scared to really take on challenges or go after what you want in life, you're not going to be happy and you're never going to be fulfilled. But there's more for you out there. But you got to get out of that unknown and create it. Come on. So good. Where? Because I know people want this. Where can they find you? Where can they connect with you to get more of what they got today? Yeah. So the easiest way is Instagram. It's Sean M. Crane. S-E-A-N-M. And then C-R-A-N-E. I'm on Facebook. Sean Michael Crane. Um, and you can find my book on Amazon too. It's Prison of Your Own. 
So good. Well, Sean, thank you so much, man, for blessing us with your time, but more importantly, imparting imparting what you have inside of you to change our life today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I have a feeling this won't be the last time you're on the show or the last time that we do some things together, man. So thank you so much. That's right, brother. Let's go. Boom. Boom.